All right, so I have uh, a number of slides uh, today for the um, blockchain lecture. And we start with a little bit of um, overview of some of the fundamental concepts. And um, normally I sort of ask students to tell me more about yourself, but we can skip that part. And I will sort of jump into the topic of cryptocurrencies straight away. Uh, this is a, a screenshot or like a photograph of an in-flight magazine that Norwegian had uh, in their planes when they were flying. It was in 2019, I took the photo and they were promising to have Wi-Fi on all, international, all intercontinental flights by 2020. And also they were planning to introduce a virtual currency, which they plan to introduce as a payment method in Norwegian. Uh, and uh, the question here is why would they try to do that? Why would they think having a virtual currency is a good idea? What do you think? So they say in a few years, virtual currency will bypass the old payment systems we have today, and we'll have wave goodbye to most credit cards and cash for the benefit of both customers in Norwegian. So what do they mean for the benefit of customers and the Norwegian as a, as a company? So why, why they were thinking about it? Of course, it didn't happen. They had into financial problems. They kind of struggling to survive at the moment. But um, at the peak, they were kind of thinking about it. And there are some other you know, big companies which are thinking of introducing cryptocurrencies or virtual currencies as a payment mechanism and why would that be? Why would they do that? So what, um, what reason you can think of that makes sense for Norwegian to, to be thinking about this? Well, I'm guessing that they would like to connect their clients uh, to their product more strongly. Uh, because with that type of currency, I can use only at Norwegian. So maybe I buy more at Norwegian or if I get some uh, back, uh, if Norwegian owe me any money because for example, they cancel flight then they give, can give me back in those type of currency. Then again, I'm only able to use at their company. So I think it's kind of a leash, you know, that they can hold their clients on. Yeah, that's a very good point. So that that's definitely a, a good point. And you see that even without the virtual currencies in a form of uh, tokens or some uh, royalties cards and royalties points. So airlines are doing that already. You know, uh, food chains are doing it. Petrol stations are doing it. They're trying to have some sort of currency. It's not really a currency. It's not really something that you can go anywhere and buy bread for, but that's some sort of um, payment mechanism which you can use to get some, to gain some benefit. So like, for example, if you collect points in a particular petrol station, then you can redeem them for petrol, right? Uh, so it's exactly the same, the same here. So that, that is definitely a very good, good point. Thank you. What else? Yeah, Ben. Uh, I'm kind of question. this is not completely related to what you kind of ask, but I'm kind of questioning, what is kind of the, the difference between Norwegian saying we want uh, to make our own cryptocurrency and say Tesla just buying billions in Bitcoins instead of making their own system? It is kind of related to what she just said with, it's a token system that is tied into an environment. So that kind of answers my questions somewhat, but yeah. You yeah, can, so... I can't really see Norwegian expecting to make money on this if they kind of want to tie it into their own ecosystem. Yeah, so let's let's uh, let's put that a little bit on hold. Let's wait for others uh, to to think. What else? What other reasons you you might think having your own currency would help? Uh, like controlled by Norwegian or in a form of let's say Bitcoin. Like what if Norwegian accepts Bitcoin instead of the normal payment okay. mechanisms? So what, what are the potential benefits? I think it will give them a benefit uh, in security. Yeah, can you elaborate a little bit more? Um, 
so the, the payment will be secure and uh, definitely secure the payment. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, so that you, you're kind of on a good track. So that that is um, um, one of the problems with uh, credit cards fraud is that people steal credit cards and buy flight tickets with those stolen credit cards. And the airlines and the customer like people are losing quite a lot of money because of the fraud of like credit card fraud. Um, so this with cryptocurrencies can be kind of li limited. It can be uh, basically removed because in cryptocurrencies, you can't really pretend to be somebody else. Like the payments are very, as you mentioned, like very secure and very um, determined such that if somebody makes a payment, that means um, that payment is always legitimate. It's, it's not, I mean, you, of course, people can steal cryptocurrencies. They can steal digital wallets. That can happen as well. But the typical credit card fraud is not non-existent in, in let's say Bitcoin or in some uh, made up cryptocurrency by Norwegian. So that is definitely a, a factor as well. Um, so Jon is suggesting that you can set your own rules uh, and then you can basically enforce the, the, the rules. So it's similar to the first point about this kind of reality type programs and the reward programs and how you can manage that and how you keep track, keep track of things. Uh, some cryptocurrencies, they have anonymity built in and some don't. So for example, in a royalties program, uh, the tokens that you have, they are kind of attached to you by name, by, by an identity such that they are not easily uh, changeable. Like I cannot give my, um, you know, without, let's say I have some petrol station tokens and I want to give it to my wife. Some, some petrol stations allow you to do that, some don't, but I cannot decide, like it's, it's decided by the petrol station, right? Um, so that allows them to control also who is the frequent flyer, how people spend the money, what sort of services they buy, and kind of a, be a very specific on how the cash flow is actually happening, right? So they can get more value out of the customer analytics. Um, yeah, so um, people, uh, the, the suggestion from Martina is that people buy tickets or whatever they buy in different currencies and from different accounts. And then uh, Norwegian or whoever wants to keep track of, of people purchasing purchases doesn't have this control because it's a little bit all over the place. So yeah, that's another point that they could control uh, the customer relationship better. Um, uh, yeah, so cryptocurrencies technology is a blockchain technology and um, maybe there is a bit of a hype around blockchain. So maybe that's a kind of a good marketing stunt to, to pull out. Um, yeah, that might be a reason. Um, another reason is that Credit cards, if you're making payments, uh, let's say the flight costs 1,000 krona, 1,000 krona, and then you pay 1,000 krona, then you know between five to 30% of that amount goes to the money exchangers and um, payment processors and all of that. So there is overhead such that Norwegian is probably gonna get 700 out of this 1,000 or 800. So they're losing certain money because of the infrastructure that is currently supporting the, uh, the payment system. Uh, if you're making purchase in the different currency, that may get even worse. Uh, and the payment systems, you know, in theory, all payments is just changing numbers on two accounts. It's like a digital thing. It's almost like a, a URL request. It's like HTTP GET request. It almost costs nothing uh, to do uh, electronically. So the electronic money transfer is, is effectively very, very cheap, it's, you know, uh, but you have those um, uh, money processors and you have those payment processors and they kind of in between you and the, the, um, the supplier. Uh, and it can be like for a, a visa payment, it can be up to nine people along the way. So 
like, you know, I, I, I'm paying for my flight to Norwegian and then eight other people get paid because they are kind of on, on the way of this happening, right? And that is ridiculous. Uh, so the traditional banking system and traditional money, um, and, uh, you know, remittance, they are somewhat um, inefficient. They, they are kind of not really uh, operating with customer in mind and they don't um, streamline some things that could be streamlined. So they, you know, um, we would wave goodbye to most credit cards and cash for the benefit, right? So of course uh, with cash that you, you don't have that problem, uh, but with credit cards you do. Um, so, you know, that could be a, a reason as well. Um, so yeah, so the, the point, uh, Ben's point about, do you really want your own currency or can you just accept cryptocurrencies like, you know, Bitcoin or some other ones? Uh, the, the, the main difference is the control, right? So with, with Bitcoin, you will not have the extra overheads with the money processors, but you will have the miners fee and the Bitcoin payments are also a little bit costly. Like, you know, a single Bitcoin transaction currently costs about $10, right? So if you, um, you know, $10, if, if the purchase amount is small, that's quite a high percentage. If the purchase amount is big, that is not too bad, right? Uh, if I'm buying something for thousand dollars, ten dollars is like one percent, so it's not too bad. But if I'm buying something for hundred dollars, then ten dollars is ten percent, so that is quite substantial, right? Uh, of course, you can aggregate that, so you can have a certain aggregation of um, of payments such that you only need one Bitcoin transaction to to kind of aggregate it. Um, so. We had a meeting yesterday with a representative from Microsoft and they are working on a decentralized identity management system. Uh, and they're planning to use Bitcoin as the underlying source of trust, underlying kind of a grand truth for certain things such that uh, it is fully decentralized system. You don't need any custodians, any stewards or any kind of uh, uh, entities overlooking the system. You can kind of do it in a decentralized fashion and they are gonna piggyback on Bitcoin. But you know, with Bitcoin and the cost of $10 per transaction, that is kind of costly. So what they do, they batch the requests that they need to do up to 10,000 requests and they do it as a single, um, single Bitcoin transaction, right? So the, the people who are interacting with the system will kind of issue the, the operations. They will issue the, um, uh, the things that need, need to be done, they will batch it into 10,000 and then issue a single transaction, which means for a single identifier, it will effectively cost one cent, right? So every single operation will be very cheap. It will cost um, a customer one cent to have it sort of executed. Uh, so you can kind of overcome some of the limitations here and make the system a bit more efficient. But the, the bottom line is, I think, is the control. So if you have your own currency, you can kind of as um, so, yeah, so you, Jon Gunnar was saying like, you can play by your own rules. So you can specify what the rules are and you can enforce them. If you're playing with Bitcoin or with another existing currency, you have to follow the rules which, which they already have. And also you lose certain amount of control. Um, so the batch method is, uh, is different to Lightning. So one way of um, making payments in Bitcoin more cheap is to use this kind of a lightning network concept, which is an overlay payment network on top of, um, of Bitcoin. But this um, mechanism for identities is, is a little bit different because they don't need to make payments. It, it has nothing to do with uh, money changing hands. It's all about you having ownership of your own identity and making sure that people cannot abuse it. Uh, so it's a, like it's slightly different objectives and the mechanics are, are slightly different. So it's not um, not similar, but it, it is a solution for the bottleneck, which Bitcoin itself is. Um, all right. Uh, ben, one question have... though. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I forgot to take down my hand. So yeah, uh, I have a question about the legality of using the different currencies, etc. Because I know that in the in the U.S. Uh, United States, 
-hmm. you're not allowed to pay your workers in anything except dollars, I do believe. Yeah. And so... I'm not entirely sure if this is the same in Norway, but uh, how would we kind of go around that though? If we kind of introduce a lot of different currencies, should yeah, they so... all tie back to the dollar? That that is true. So the 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 topic of uh, legality and like the regulation and regulatory compliance is a, a big one. Uh, it depends at the moment. It depends on the country. So different countries have different attitudes towards that and different allowances. So for example, there are countries which are quite crypto um, friendly. Let's say, uh, and one of those countries in, is New Zealand. So in New Zealand, you can pay your employers uh, in, in cryptocurrencies and you can uh, pay for goods in cryptocurrencies. You can use them as sort of a medium of exchange if you want. And then you have to convert it on the time of the transaction into New, New Zealand dollar and make your tax obligation in New Zealand dollars. Uh, they were planning to have ability to make tax obligations in virtual currencies as well. But that hasn't happened yet, and I don't know any country that that has that. But in some countries, it is strictly forbidden to to use another currency as a medium of exchange. And Norway is one of those countries. So in Norway, it is illegal to have any other means of exchange rather than a Norwegian krona. Uh, but um, the the problem I was trying to illustrate wasn't that. Uh, I mean, in New Zealand, for example, you're still technically getting paid in money. The cryptocurrency they are paying you in is worth X amount of uh, New Zealand dollar. Correct. But it was uh, the law was introduced uh, in say uh, to avoid cities or smaller communities to have monopolies where you basically got paid in tokens you could use inside the environment that basically was like a fancy form of slave labor to kind of you're not this token is only valid at this store but you can't use it in the general uh, market kind of deal. That's why they went away from the token system over to just US dollar. But say the Norwegian cryptocurrency that I'm talking about here might not have a direct conversion into actual cash. Bitcoin is worth money because people buy it and trade it. So that that is true to some extent but it's not as simple as um as it sounds so even though bitcoin is converted to fiat money it's not converted to fiat money in any recognizable fashion like legal. Yeah, definitely. it's all yeah. over the place yeah exactly so it is still like you know if i have some um some old vinyl records i can convert them to cash as well right uh but there is no sort of a rate, like there is no approved, you know, there is uh, no listing in the Norges Bank. What is the exchange rate for this to this currently? There is no, Norges Bank doesn't tell you what is the exchange rate between Bitcoin and Norwegian Krona, right? Uh, and it's that way is too unstable, yeah. From the tax perspective, you need to have that, right? So, so some, and like, for example, in New Zealand, they, they, the national bank, the, the central bank doesn't have that exchange neither, but they say, if you use the recognized exchanges, we will trust that this exchange rate is correct. And then we will uh, calculate your tax obligations using that. But it's not something that, you know, it's kind of easily enforceable, right? And in Norway, you, if something is not listed on the Norges bank, then it's there is no conversion like you, you cannot really do that um yeah uh with the token system that is um that is a very interesting topic because i know of several initiatives which are kind of introducing that introducing very local currency to um to local communities and it's not negative thing it's actually a positive thing uh, so it's not in a sense of monopoly that uh, monopoly has some sort of negative connotations. It's a, in a sense of forcing the money flow and value flow to stay within a certain region or certain city such that it helps to grow that economic um, properties of, of that region or, or of that city. 
Uh, so oh yeah, definitely. It has yeah. pros and cons, but it would be kind of annoying that if I kind of make money in Oslo and I go to Sweden and I can't spend said money or currency, that would kind of be limiting. Yeah, so that's true. Uh, but what if so? So that's true. That that is something limiting. But what if that's not the limit? What if you can earn Oslo currency? And it's not Norwegian krona, and you can go to Stockholm and spend it in Stockholm. And because it's not a Norwegian krona and it's not a Swedish krona, it's kind of something that is not regulated, something that is not controlled. Then you make transactions and you don't pay any sort of tax on the on those transactions, right? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. But then there must be some sort of agreement or trans transfer rate of sort, if say. Uh, Oslo operates with Oslo currency and Stockholm operates with uh, Stockholm currency. We need to kind of have a conversion rate or some sort of agreement. Yeah, but, but that, yeah, so that's what the central banks do. And that's what the central banks of different countries control. And then they don't really want a competing currency to, to be doing that with, right? So, oh, yeah, definitely. But yeah. I'm just thinking that you can't have them too centralized or having them in an area that is too small to some degree because then you're kind of limited in terms of where you can spend the currency i guess yeah yeah that's right so th th those are kind of um th those are difficult topics like uh, nobody really knows exactly how to do it we we will discuss a little bit more about the the value of money and how how it works but uh let's yeah let's move on uh so this was also in 2019 uh, a predicted growth by Cisco of um, of blockchain technology and blockchain importance. And they were predicting certain things to go certain way, such that they started investing and started looking into blockchain technology. Um, but before we start talking about blockchain itself, we need to cover some fundamental, uh, fundamental aspects. So, the first one is hashing. What what is hashing? In uh, one sentence, how would you summarize it? Uh, maybe it's a key that changes uh, every time when person uh, changes the. Mm, as uh, a blockchain, something in the code. Okay, so let me go to, let's see how my drawing will go. Uh, how to draw. So we have, um, yeah, I was explaining folds uh, in the lecture in the morning, like how to fold a list. Okay, so what you're saying is that we have some sort of, um, some sort of input and we have some sort of output and then we have a relationship kind of uh, from the kind of let's say some text um, yeah not too good with this and then we have some sort of key right and then if we change the text the key will change right so that's one property right uh, so one property is that if we modify the text, um, then the, the key, and here we have this kind of a hashing function. So that's one property. What other properties we, we expect from hashing? A small change to the input text will drastically change the key. Perfect, yes. So we want this change, even if we change just one bit, right? Even if we change one bit um, of data, we want almost all the bits in the key to change, right? We want like a really messed up thing. Why we want that? To avoid the possibility of reverse engineering the hashing algorithm or finding a uh, input that looks like a key and then being able to guess what input that will generate a specific key. Exactly. So what we want is this to be impossible, right? Um, yeah, it's a one-way function. 
impossible. Impossible. All right, you know, you know, you get the idea. So if changing this slightly would change this slightly, we could kind of uh, work it out how to get somehow back, right? By playing with those small changes. But if change here completely messes up this, kind of reverse engineering this is very hard and that makes it really hard to go from the key to a text or to find a text which matches a particular key, right? So we want to have a function h, which is one way, which makes it really hard to go back, which makes this property that any small change leads to a lot of change here. And uh, yeah, so I listed three three properties. So the, the first one is, is effectively this kind of um, uh, avalanche property that we, we change a lot when we're given the key. The second one is that this is a one-way function and going backwards is kind of hard. And the third thing is that we would like the collisions to be um, really hard to find, right? So if I, what is a collision? Collision is um, T1 and T2, which are different. They both lead to the same key, right? To key K. So if I have two different inputs, and they both lead to the same key, I have a collision, right? And the problem with collisions is that if I'm validating something, if I, for example, have a job contract and it is validated and signed and hashed with a particular thing, so I have a job contract T1 and it says I'm gonna earn, you know, 100,000 krona, but I have another one which hashes to the same key and it says that I'm gonna earn 1 million krona, that's a big problem because they both hash to the same value, to the same key, and that key has been signed or whatever, approved by. And then I have two documents which kind of give me the same, um, the same key. So we want the collisions to be, you know, difficult to find or difficult, difficult to generate and also to be relatively rare, such that, you know, two documents um, mapping to the same key are kind of uh, not that uh, frequent, okay? So we want those kind of uh, three properties. So where are my slides? All right, so we kind of covered the, the hashing. Uh, what hashing algorithms do you know? 256 SHA. Yeah, so one is... Uh, Sha. I think that's one of the more common one. Yeah. Do you remember SHA-1? So git, git I... is SHA-1. Um, yeah, we have now SHA-256. So SHA-1 was, uh, yes. uh, was the same as SHA-256, but it had a shorter key. It was a 128 key. And GitHub, no, not GitHub, Git uses it for hashing all the change sets such that we can keep track of the change sets in a Git protocol. Uh, and Google has demonstrated that with their uh, infrastructure, I think it was a couple of years ago, that they can generate key collisions. They can generate basically commits that will hash to the same key such that they can fake some commits uh, and manipulate it, by, you know, they can manipulate the Git history by modifying the, the actual chain set to introduce, let's say vulnerability, which will map to the same Git hash. And then if somebody cherry picks that, it will, they will get basically the malicious code, okay? Uh, it hasn't been exploited and the risk of people exploiting it are really small such that I actually don't know if Git changed it or not, if, if Git is currently not using SHA-1 or still using SHA-1, uh, but that was the idea. So, you know, once a particular hashing algorithm is demonstrated to be exploitable, then this hashing algorithm stops being so good, so strong, right? If I can like, not I, but Google can generate key collisions that becomes kind of um, problematic. So another hashing algorithm that you probably heard of, but um, not used anymore is MD5. Have you heard of, of this one? 
it, yeah, I think it's mostly used for checksums. Yeah, exactly. So it is still used for checksums. It's still very good kind of hashing algorithm just for validating or verifying certain things. And that was the main hashing algorithm which was used in Unix systems uh, for hashing passwords. So, you know, we don't store passwords in the plain text. We store the hashes of the passwords. And then when the new, like when the user wants to log in, they type the password and then the password is hashed and then the hash is transferred and compared to the hash in the system that they want to log into such that the permission is granted or not, such that you don't transfer plain text over potentially insecure network, that's one thing. And for second thing is you don't want to store plain text passwords such that, you know, that the database might be exploitable or those passwords might leak. And MD5, um, I actually, I was teaching, uh, we were teaching Linux and we were teaching uh, some of the network security. And I remember when we transitioned out of MD5 being used for hashing to a, a new hashing algorithms uh, because MD5 was shown to be crackable. Like you can use John the Ripper or you can use some other algorithms to brute force and to use rain, uh, you know, hash uh, rain rainbow tables. And you could kind of, um, given a hash, you could find a password which matches that hash. Uh, whether that password was really the password of the user or whether that password just coincidentally matches the hash, it doesn't matter because you can still use that password to log in for the services that the user was using a particular hash pa password with MD5 hash, right? Um, so the key um, aspect of the hashing is how secure it is, like how exploitable it is to find a key collision or to find a plain text which hashes to that to that hash. Um, and um, usually the length of the key, like for example, with the SHA-1 or SHA-256, uh, there is a SHA-512 as well, and so on. You can make the, the, the key uh, length longer and then it makes much more difficult to, to find collisions or to find exploits because the search space becomes bigger and bigger, right? So with small, uh, small hashes, like if I have a very small set to search through, I can brute force all the possible combinations and I can kind of um, quickly, you know, solve some of the hashing problems. If the key, key is very long, then the search space becomes uh, unimaginably large, such that with given computational resources, I cannot brute force it. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to use very long keys because it's cumbersome in terms of communication and so on. So you, you're balancing those two trade-offs. From one hand, you want something that is secure enough and on the other hand, you want something that is short enough, right? And secure, the more secure something is, the longer something becomes. And then the longer something becomes, it's more cumbersome to use. So you're sort of balancing those two things. And the, the sweet spot is with relatively short keys that are still uncrackable yet, right? So one of such keys is SHA-256, which has 256 bits of a key. Another one is, uh, ripe MD, which has version of 128 and 160 and 256 as well, but 160 became sort of a de facto standard. And this is the algorithm, hashing algorithm with the length 160 that is used in Bitcoin and used in some of the cryptocurrencies that we have um, in operation. So, you know, today. All right, so what is a collision? We already explained that. And what is an avalanche property? We already explained as well. So collision is if you have two plain text documents mapping to the same key. An avalanche property is that tiny modification of the input produces a huge modification of the output, right? All right, so how many of you uh, remember Gnutella? What was Gnutella? Have you ever used it? So how many of you know BitTorrent and ever used BitTorrent? <laughs> yeah. 
So Martina knows the, you know, um, the hazelnut snack spread called Nutella. Uh, what's Gnutella? It's like GNU uh, from GNU Foundation, like Linux. Um, yeah, so all the torrents are kind of the same. The original one was called BitTorrent and uh, BitTorrent protocol has now a lot of different uh, follow-up uh, clients, but the fundamental of the protocol are kind of the same. So the protocol is called uh, torrent or BitTorrent protocol. Um, yeah, so there are some micro torrents or whatever. And then do you know how they work? How, how this how this work? I can try to give it a go. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I do believe that whenever someone has a file, they can kind of share the file with other users that also stores a copy of that file. And if then an other user wants to don't know the file he can then request the users nearby that stores the said file to send him either the file or parts of the file to combine it back uh, to an original file which means that he can uh, get a little bit from everyone to combine back to one large file that is better on the bandwidth etc i do yeah. believe game clients like uh, world of warcraft or blizzard has a bit torrent or torrent capabilities for sharing off their 120 gig large game. Yeah. That's to save that, ser server space. That's a very good, uh, very good explanation. So let me quickly uh, do uh, a slightly uh, longer uh, explanation here. So if we imagine that I have, um, so let's say I have a file um, and uh, we have kind of a central server. We have a central repository of storing the uh, the indexes, right? So let's say I have this, um, uh, let's call it F. So I have a file F and this file F actually sits, um, let's copy that. Let's say it sits in three places uh, here, here, Whoops, I lost F. Yeah. And here, uh, come on. Right, so now I, I am here and I want to download file F, right? Uh, and I may have some other, um, yeah, there are some other, whoops, uh, clients kind of all over the place, which are sort of um, participant of my network. And then uh, we have some sort of a rendezvous point, some central server. And then everybody kind of tells the central server what they have, right? So um, this guy says, I have a file F. This guy says, I have file F and so on. And these guys also say what they have. And I want to download file F. So I'm, I'm going here and I'm asking, okay, can you tell me who has file, file F such that I can download it from that uh, location? So the central repository checks like some sort of hash of that file or what, however I sort of identify it. And it tells me, okay, this guy has the file, right? So, uh, so it co co contacts me back and says, uh, contact this guy and he, he has what you, what you need. So then I make a request here and I kind of download, download the file. Um, it, there are two small problems with this solution, okay? So the first, the first small problem is that while I'm downloading this file, and let's say this is like a large movie, um, I don't know, two gigabytes, and I'm kind of downloading it, uh, this guy goes offline, right? So then my download stops. I'm, I'm kind of uh, waiting for this guy to continue such that I can continue my download, right? Um, also, this note might have a limited uh, capacity, right? So if I'm downloading it from this here, then I have uh, only one kind of a channel available, right? So going offline um, is a problem. So offline is a problem. And then the second thing is bandwidth. So let's call it B. I'm really bad in typing here. Um, okay, so those are two small problems. And then there is a, a, a another problem, uh, which is, um, a third problem, which is the fact that if 
this system is used for illegal file sharing, which you know happen to be always almost always the case. Then the officials come and they say, well, you know, uh, we have to shut it down because you kind of distributing some copyrighted materials, copyrighted files, and then you cannot operate. So they kind of are close it, right? And then that's what happened with Gnutella. Gnutella was originally working like this, and it was mostly used by people sharing music, uh, which was copyrighted. Uh, and then the uh, music industry said, they yeah, are that's unfair. You know, we're losing money by use, you know, sharing all this music for free. So they kind of shut it down. So it, it is kind of a central point of failure, right? So if you shut this down, that even though the whole network still exists, the people cannot really share anything because they don't have this rendezvous point. They don't have this sort of a central server to, um, to exchange information with, okay? So um, BitTorrent came along. So the idea of, of BitTorrent is what, um, what Ben basically said. Um, we, okay, let me not redo everything. Let me just delete what I need to delete such that I don't need to redraw it. So I still have, um, I still have people with the, uh, with the files, okay? Um, I still want to ask somebody uh, about where I can download it, right? But instead of having a service, instead of having kind of a central service for it, what if I just have, um, okay, so let's use, uh, let's use square for this. Um, I have kind of a static file uh, and that static file contains information of where the fragments potentially are. And this static file can be replicated all over the place. So you can have multiple websites or multiple um, search engines or whatever publishing those kind of static files. And then all I need is just to find the, that kind of a static file that represents uh, the resource that I'm after, like represents a particular resource like F in my case. And then I mentioned fragments, right? So instead of um, distributing that you have everything, you can cut this file into, into chunks, into parts, and then advertise those chunks individually. Uh, it's sort of like uh, you take, let's say two gigabyte file and you split it in um, chunks of 500K or, or whatever the size is. And then you hash those, those chunks and you represent them as if they were the whole thing, right? And you can kind of do it in such a way that the, um, the file parts, which are kind of being shared, are mangled in such a way they don't represent anything meaningful, right? So like this file represents, um, uh, so th this file represents kind of an, an index of all the parts that I have to get to assemble something that actually works. So if I get all the parts, this file will be complete and then it will be what it should be like the, the like Word document, okay? But the individual parts, like if the Fs are kind of like, let's say this is F1, F2 and F3, they are meaningless on their own. They don't mean anything. They don't really contain anything meaningful because they are just kind of a scrambled parts of the whole. Uh, and then when this happens, when this kind of a downloading happens, uh, copyrighted material doesn't really change hands because this is not a copyrighted material. This is, but that, that whole thing only stops when I assemble it, it, not in the middle, right? So when the transfer happens, you sort of not really violating certain rules and also we don't have the central point of control. So BitTorrent was kind of an idea how to potentially prevent uh, censorship or prevent kind of uh, monitoring or prevention of sharing some documents. Uh, and of course it has been used for sharing copyrighted materials as well. But that, you know, the, the point is not about whether um, copyrighted material should be exchanged or not. Let's imagine that we have some sort of file uh, where 
uh, some oppressive government doesn't want to be distributed or spread, right? Uh, then they can kind of, if there is a central point of control, they can kind of prevent or censorship how the document is spread. But in this model, it is kind of possible to share it. Uh, and also because I'm kind of like to assemble it, I need to um, collect all the parts. I can take some parts from some peers and some other parts from other peers. And then if the peer goes offline, I can sort of continue um, downloading the, the parts that I was already downloading and only kind of um, re-request -re that particular fragment from another peer, uh, such that I don't like stop the, the whole download. I only stop kind of partial download and I can continue from another source, right? So there were kind of two innovations here. One was not to share entire files, but to share fragments of the files. And then the second innovation was not to have a service which is responsible for allocations of those um, of where resources are, but to use hashing and to use those kind of a public um, uh, descriptors of the of the fragments such that we can easily overcome this kind of a central point of control um, mechanism. So this is um, this is this point. Um, so let's. Yeah, let's have a, a short break. So it's uh, five past five past two. Uh, let's come back at um, quarter past quarter past two, and we will con continue with consistent hashing and with the distributed uh, hash tables. So I will pause the. All right. So uh, we covered we covered that. We can delete this. So now we're moving towards um, distributing hash table, but let's talk first about what is a hash table. So in a very abstract sense, what is a hash table? Some sort of a table because the name suggests so, suggests. Table of hashes, yes. That's a very good point. So in general, it is a table uh, where we have some sort of keys. So they can be hashes and usually we do use hashes, but it can be any um, um, any key will do, right? So um, for example, I can have uh, a key which is a string. So I can say A uh, and I have another key which is another string. Uh, say uh, B, and then I will kind of say that in my table, I have keys, which are strings, and they point to some data records, which is some structured data. So I could have, you know, a record, or I could have a file, I could have uh, whatever you want, kind of uh, the, the hash table. So I have a hash table here. Um, and my hash table kind of links to some kind of elements um, in the in the resulting data structure, right? Uh, they can be structural data, they can be documents, they can be records, it can be whatever, right? Um, so it is kind of like a hash map, right? But um, what we want is we want this hash table not to be central uh, stored in a single place, but we would like it to be distributed over a number of network peers. So let me um, let me delete that and let let's draw some peers. So I have some um, some network peers, and I would like to have this um, hash table distributed over them such that uh, I can always find where something is 
uh, even if some of the oops, uh, even if some of the nodes will kind of disappear. So if I have this kind of system, and at some point one of the nodes disappears, I still would like to be able to ask, okay, can you tell me where uh, Mario's record is? And I know the key, the key is A, can I get it? Okay, uh, such that we can kind of uh, distribute it over all over the place, right? So one way of doing that is to use, um, so what you can do is you can say, okay, let's arrange the peers into some form of a ring such that we will kind of communicate over TCP IP uh, between the, 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 the nodes, but we will create kind of a additional network such that I can, um, so let's say this is me, I am kind of a part of the network uh, and I do participate in looking up for, for, for things. Um, so I know my kind of a successor and I know my predecessor and I kind of know that they have the same kind of a setup. So we all are kind of connected like this. Um, so I, I actually don't need to be part of the network to issue a query. Like if I want to know uh, who has um, who has what content, I don't need to be part of the network. I just need to ask one of the nodes, like, okay, can you find me this particular key? And then I will get a, get an answer, right? So we could actually model it that I am kind of uh, here and I ask, okay, where something is to this guy, right? Uh, with the query. So we can kind of imagine that I'm doing a query, whoops, um, and that the query is from outside. So now if we have this sort of network, we all communicate over TCP IP, we have to sort of recognize ourselves somehow. So what we could do is we could use our IP addresses and hash them and organize ourselves in such a way that we kind of um, having kind of a consecutive numbers out of the out of the network. So uh, imagine that I, I have kind of an IP address uh, and it kind of has four bytes and imagine that I can hash it to a number between one and 20, okay? So I only have 20 slots such that um, um, I have a small number here. I have one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five such that the collision is quite, quite small uh, for my hashing, such that each of those nodes will kind of get a unique number between one and 20, right? So let's say this guy got number three, then I got seven, I don't know, uh, eight, um, 11 and 16, okay? So because there is nobody more than 16, this guy ropes up to the first node in the network, right? So I have kind of a unique numbers which are from hashing the IP addresses. And I have a certain content now that I need to store uh, in this kind of network. Um, so of course we are communicating over TCP IP, uh, but at the same time, we're communicating kind of in this distributed hash table. So we have a concept of, let me move to the next slide. We have a concept of a circular over, overlay network, right? So what is an overlay network? It's some sort of network which has a, another network below itself. So the TCP IP is a network protocol stack that those peers are using. But on top of the TCP IP, I have this other network, which is my circle, my kind of a circle of friends, uh, which we know how they are um, identified and how they kind of communicate. So this forms an overlay network on top of the normal TCP IP traffic, right? Um, all right, so now what we need is we need to somehow distribute those resources, right? So let's say the keys are like this, the keys are in a form of strings and then they kind of point to some, some uh, resources, right? So like a resource one, uh, resource two and resource three. All right, so indexing things with strings worked fine for this map, 
but it's not kind of really helping us here. It would be nice if those keys are also numbers because then we could kind of use the mechanism of this overlay network to spread them around. So let's say, let's imagine that we, um, yeah, so this points to here. So let's imagine that we hash those, um, those identifiers the same way as we hash the IP addresses into a subset, which is also like, again, we have a, a really small number of, of resources here. So let's say I have uh, one more, uh, which is somewhere here, uh, which is a resource four. So then maybe one to 20 will be enough. We will not have collisions. Like having collisions here is okay uh, because we can sort of um, store multiple things under the same, um, well, we cannot store multiple things under the same key because then we would have two answers to a particular key, right? A one-to-one -one mapping is probably what we want. So we probably want large enough um, key space such that we don't kind of have collisions. But for the sake of academic discussion, if we only have one to 20, let's imagine that um, we have this resource. Um, yeah, so let's say this one kind of uh, maps to um, number three, uh, no, three is we'll, uh, whatever, right? So this one is three, let's say this one is four. Uh, this one, let, let it be um, nine. And then the final one, let, let it be 17. All right, so we have kind of a four hashes for those four resources and we spread them around in such a way that the uh, the the resource gets the same key as the uh, as the host, such that uh, resource three. So this this guy will be stored in uh, peer three, uh, and then number four uh, is larger than three, and we will use the next uh, available successor to keep that resource in in the in the in the place such that, um, so this one stores uh, index three or key, key three, that one stores number four. Then we have number nine. Again, we use the closest successor of this number, which is available, which in this case is this one. So it will be nine. And then 17 is larger than 16. So it kind of ropes back uh, to this guy. So this guy stores two documents. This guy stores one, this no none, one, none, right? We have a very sparse kind of a representation at the moment. So now, no matter which peer I ask, I issue a query and I say, I want to find uh, um, document three, right? I'm looking for document three. So I'm saying query for document three. Uh, peer eight says, well, um, index three is uh, smaller than me. So I will ask my predecessor, to search for it because it has to be somewhere you know below me and I don't have it. So it asks this guy. So there is a communication message here. This guy says, oh, I don't know about three, but I will ask my predecessor such that uh, it goes here. And this guy says, oh yeah, I have it. Uh, here it is, right? Uh, and then after like two hops, I found it. Uh, you can imagine that uh, in the, the worst case scenario, if I ask this guy, the, so if I issue the query to this guy, um, it actually has to go backwards like one, two, three, four times, right? So I would have to have almost N messages if I have uh, N nodes to find where, where it is. So it is a little bit inefficient. Um, so one mechanism to overcome this inefficiency is that what we can do is instead of storing just the predecessor and the successor of a particular, uh, uh, you know, um, of a particular um, uh, order in my peers, I also store a shortcut. So each, each node stores two normal links, your predecessor and successor, but also stores some sort of a semi-random shortcut somewhere else in the network such that they can do a little bit more 
uh, faster searching, right? So let's say this guy also knows about this guy. I know about, uh, not I, but number eight knows about this guy. And then this node knows about this. And then this node knows about this. And we also need this node knowing about this one. Uh, so now we have kind of a net overlay network with successors and predecessors, but we also know some sort of shortcut. So this time, if I issue a query about node number three, uh, this can check, okay, it is uh, something I don't know, but wait a minute, there is actually, I know about the node which matches your, your ID such that I can ask that node for your query and chances are that node will know, right? So then after a single query to this node, I, I get the response. If I, uh, let's say I asked, um, um, yeah, I ask this node, so I issue a query about document number 17, uh, such that um, instead of this guy forwarding me to his successor, he knows it's better to forward me to his shortcut because chances are the shortcut will be closer to 17 than the successor. So it forwards me here and then this guy forwards me here and then after two hops, I have the answer. Normally, if I did this query to this node, I would have one, two, three, four, right? So we kind of uh, reduced reduce the number of hops that we need to, to search for it. Um, all right, so that kind of works really well. Uh, let's kind of um, cut down the uh, some things from it such that we have a simpler picture. And now let's imagine uh, number nine dies. It drops out of the network, right? We have two problems. Uh, one problem is my uh, or number eight successor doesn't exist anymore. So this, they needs to be some sort of rewiring, right? So the predecessor of 16 becomes eight and the successor of eight becomes 16, right? So they need to rewire themselves such that you establish this link. So that's one, one thing. Uh, you have to kind of uh, rewire your predecessor and successor and potentially your shortcut links such that the network is still cohesive. Um, the other problem is this node went down and it took with, with it document number nine, right? So the document nine, which is the resource tool, uh, doesn't exist anymore. So that's kind of a problem. So we can't kind of have that. So normally what happens is uh, you as a node ask, you know about your successor and your predecessor and you ask them, what do they know? And you cache what they know on your on your on your uh, on your node. Uh, so you ask your um, so, um, you actually you ask your predecessor uh, what they the guy knows, and then you cache it as a copy. So I know about like number eight knows. Um, let me delete this query thing. So I am number eight. Uh, so let's highlight me. I'm kind of uh, operating um, operating number eight. So when I say I, I mean number eight. Um, and then I will cache my own data, which in this case is nothing, but I will also cache this uh, other node documents, which in this case is number four, in such a way that if this node drops out, uh, I can kind of take over the this node duties because I'm now the uh, successor and the the next highest index for the documents that this guy has, right? So if this guy drops out, I am kind of the responsible for those documents. In case of nine, it would be number sixteen. <clears throat> so number sixteen was was having a cache of his predecessor documents such when this document, um, when this node dropped out, it took over. And then we kind of established the, uh, the network and it continues to operate well, okay? Um, <coughs> sorry. What if, um, what if this guy doesn't drop out, um, but 
we have, um, okay, let's cut that out. What if this node doesn't drop out, but I have a new node coming in um, somewhere here uh, and the node says, hey, I'm here, uh, what can I help with? And we say, okay, what is your index? What is your number? And the guy says, ah, oh, my index is 10, right? Uh, then we say, well, actually you fit in between number 11 and eight, uh, such that again, we have to rewire the, uh, the connections. So you are my successor now. Uh, you have a successor, which is number 11. And the, you became actually responsible for some of those documents because you are the next uh, successor out of this index, right? So, so the responsibility for this document kind of shifts to this guy, but this guy, because it's the successor, it keeps the copy, right? So this guy kind of uh, keeps, um, keeps the copy of some of the documents which now are responsible, uh, number 10 is responsible for. Does it make sense? So all this works um, under one condition. And this condition is that um, if I introduce new node or if I change an existing node, uh, which this node drops out, I don't need to remap the hashes of all those uh, other nodes, right? The hashing function has to be done in such a way that I don't need to change um, those um, hashes of all the existing peers if I have less or more nodes to hash into, right? Um, so, you know, I, I prepare the network for 20 hosts, right? Uh, let's say I, I am kind of reaching the limit and I have sort of a, a, a 20, you know, 19 hosts and one guy comes in uh, and it's, you know, very unlikely for me to be having the kind of the hash to, to 20, but, you know, I, I need to expand. So I have to say, at some point I have to say, look, our hashing function was great, but uh, one to 20 is not enough. I need like one to 100 now. Uh, and when I do that, I would like to keep the existing hashes the way they are in such a way that I don't need to remap everything and move all the documents everywhere else, right? Does it make sense? So I hope it does. Uh, so we have this kind of uh, concept of a consistent hashing. And consistent hashing is basically an idea that if you change the space into which you're kind of hashing into, uh, normally that means all the values are completely different, right? So if I'm, if I have a, uh, documents which I'm hashing with uh, SHA-128, and then I say I need to expand the key size to 256, uh, what will what I will end up with? I will end up with all my SHA-128 hashes being different than for 256, right? I don't have any nice padding. I don't have the same sort of a uh, uh, beginning of the hash, it, it's all different. I have the avalanche property and like, you know, expanding the key space will usually mess up with everything I have. Uh, but with consistent hashing that tries to minimize the amount of existing hashes that happened in such a way that it keeps them uh, unchanged. Uh, so like, the way the hashing works is it kind of uh, generates, let's say this is my search space, uh, initial one, and it generates some hashes here, right? So I have some kind of points in, in this space. And then if I expand it, the original values, the original documents, the plain text still hashes to those same points. It's just that kind of I have now expanded the space such that the new documents or some other hashes that I will be generating will be kind of uh, having a kind of a, um, a larger search space to fit into. And that is kind of tricky to do. Uh, and the consistent hashing, uh, uh, you know, um, uses those hashing algorithms to achieve that. Uh, because I want to maintain as much of my network with the nodes moving out and moving in un unchanged. Otherwise, everyone, every time 
someone goes out or comes back, I would have to redo everything from scratch and that's very costly, right? So we discussed predecessor, successor and shortcut links. And then peer churn is like the rate at which nodes disappear or new nodes come into the network and so on, right? So uh, for some of the networks, the peer churn is very high. Uh, the nodes fluctuate all the time. You may have, you know, active 20 nodes, but those 20 nodes, each of them lives for a very short time, you know, a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. And then new nodes come in, those nodes drop out, new nodes come in and so on. So overall, the network kind of fluctuates, but it consistently keeps itself around 20. But none of the nodes kind of lives for long such that the network is stable. It kind of uh, fluctuates. Uh, in some overlay networks, the, those are very stable. Uh, and then the, the, um, the rate at which the nodes change is not as as bad uh, or the, the peer churn is, is lower, right? All right, any questions about that? I hope that was kind of a good um, insight into how the circular uh, hash tables work. And the, that algorithm that I kind of described here is called CORD. So you can, uh, if you want to learn more, you can uh, Google it and you can uh, learn more about court. There is another one which is kind of very popular, uh, which is called Kademlia. Um, Kademlia. Uh, and that's kind of a variation of, or again, on the circular distributed hash table. Uh, but in Kademlia, the neighborhood is a little bit more arbitrary. Like here, we have a very deterministic way of who is a neighbor of whom. Uh, and then the nodes cannot really, um, you know, cheat or uh, squeeze themselves somewhere. Like it is kind of deterministically uh, organized by the hashing functions that are organizing it. And let's say IP addresses or something like this. In Kademlia, this is a little bit more flexible and you can organize the topologies in slightly, uh, you know, more flexible fashion. But in some use cases and in some applications, you don't want that. You don't want this flexibility because it can potentially be abused. Uh, so maybe uh, going with court is the uh, a better approach. Um, so you can you can check that, and if you're kind of interested, of course, you can read a little bit more about the internals of BitTorrent uh, and how it works and how it is kind of similar to to Git because they use, again, a hashing algorithm to uh, organize the change sets, which then assemble the final sort of file, right? So there is kind of like a, a nice um, uh, similarities between uh, some of those protocols and some of other protocols that use hashing as a fundamental uh, building block, like Git, for example. All right, so we discussed that. Uh, what's next? Oh yeah, public private key cryptography. So um, who wants to give it a shot? What is public private key cryptography? Come on, it's quite simple. Yeah, like I say, but not on a like a very technical level, like uh, exactly how it works with the modulo, uh, you know, um, algebras, but kind of conceptually, like how 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 it works. Um, there's a sender and a receiver. The sender encrypts the message with a public key, and you have a private key which you can use to then unlock the message on the receiving side. Yeah, perfect. So we have, um, let me quickly do two people. So we have two people. Um, okay, we have a person. Of course, we're gonna have Alice um, and we have, a, we have Bob. Okay, so um, Bob has, um, so let's do square as a public key. 
So Alice has a public key and Bob has a public key. And then uh, they both have um, kind of an equivalent uh, private key, which they don't share with anybody, right? So the public keys are for Alice. Um, uh, it's okay. And Bob, uh, you know, shared such that uh, they become kind of a public knowledge. Uh, so usually we use some sort of a sharing server uh, for um, for distributing the the public keys, or we include them into our emails or whatever. And now, what can happen? Uh, Alice wants to send a message, private message to Bob. So she is using Bob's private public key. Uh, so let's have a message. Whoops, not the circle. All right. So she she takes some sort of message um, and then using using um, Bob's key she encrypts it so she it was originally plain text and now with the key uh, it becomes kind of an encrypted message and then she sends it uh, to Bob and this encrypted message um, so okay this is not visible anymore it's kind of part of this uh, envelope uh, so Bob is using his private key to read it right so this is the first kind of a use case in which case Alice can securely or secretly communicate with Bob and nobody else. Like we have some, you know, we have Charlie who is um, kind of eavesdropping on the communication. So Charlie is um, kind of, uh, come on. Oh, yeah, 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 that was a bad, bad idea. So one more time. Um, uh, I cannot move it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, forget it. So I have Charlie here, right? So imagine that there is Charlie here. Uh, Charlie can, you know, eavesdrop on this message, but cannot decipher it, right? Uh, because he doesn't have the access to the private key. If the private key leaks, of course, the whole thing collapses, right? So if somehow someone got hold of Bob's private key, then, you know, the game is over. Um, so the first use case is the encryption. What what is the second use case? What you can use it for? Um, the private public key cryptography. So that was Alice uh, communicating with Bob by sending him a message. So kind of um, encrypted. Enc, let's say with Charlie kind of eavesdropping here. Uh, what else can we do? Exactly, very good. So we can sign. And what we can do is we can send message to Alice um, and Bob can kind of create a message and he can generate a signature of the message here, attaching the signature to the message. And he generates the signature by using his private key. So he, using his private key, can sign the message and send it to Alice. And now Alice got the, the, the mail. Um, and Charlie also tries to uh, pretend that, you know, uh, Bob invites her for, um, I don't know, a party on Thursday and Charlie wants to mess things up and says, no, 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 the party is on Wednesday and he pretends to be Bob, right? So he sends another message to her, but he cannot fake the signature because he doesn't have access to the private key. So Alice can validate if the message is really from Bob by using again, Bob's uh, public key and the signature to check if the message hasn't been tampered with or whether the message is legitimate, right? So we use it for signing. So in other words, we have kind of a two use cases, right? <clears throat> we have um, a use case for 
providing a proof of um, uh, authenticity, like we did with the uh, with the case of the signing. Uh, so we can kind of use the private key to hash the message and prove that it's authentic. Only Bob could have generated the original message because only Bob has access to private key and he could sign it, right? So it's kind of a proof of authenticity. And then the other way around, we can prove that the uh, that something belongs to Bob because only Bob can kind of get it out of the box. So uh, something that has been given to Bob, like by Alice uh, generating the message and signing it with his public key makes it inaccessible to anybody else. Nobody else can get in and get the, the mail out or the value out or whatever that is. Uh, only Bob can do it. So that proves that wh whatever that is, is owned by Bob because nobody else can, can get it out. All right, so um, with those things, with the hashing, uh, with the overlay peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, with some form of decentralized uh, distributed hash table. And with the private public key cryptography, you basically have all the building blocks that are needed for um, generating a blockchain. Uh, and then what is a blockchain? Um, a, a blockchain is a distributed ledger, which is append only, um, and it allows participating parties to lock certain entries or certain transactions in that ledger in such a way that there, there is a single source of truth and um, it's impossible to modify the history, the, the past events which happened. And it's also impossible to have inconsistency in such a way that um, the ledger is not uh, a linear structure of entries that has been put into it. Um, and the first experiment, as you know, is called Bitcoin and it started in uh, 2009, um, at the end of 2008, uh, January 2009 was the kind of the uh, public uh, launch of the, of the system, the, the white paper happened a little bit earlier uh, and it has been used to represent uh, digital cash or digital money. Um, so the first use case was for representing money. Um, and we had this discussion at the beginning of the previous lecture. Uh, what is money? What is real money? And what's not real money? Uh, are there, you know, uh, membership points of some sort of uh, uh, schema money or not money? Well, like if you collect points in some supermarket and then you can go and buy grocery for those points, is it really a money or is it not money? What defines money? How, you know, how money works? Um, so I have a couple of um, slides here, which we can go quickly through, um, <clears throat> which talk about money. Um, but first, um, one more technical question. What's a database and what's a distributed database? What's the difference between database and distributed database? That is a bit tricky question, to be honest. Like if you Google it, uh, you're not gonna get like a single cohesive answer. Uh, it's a little bit uh, complicated. So, you know, normally you can think of a database as a single storage of some sort of data, right? Uh, if we talk about distributed database, um, what do we mean? Do we mean that the queries which come in are handled by a number of services, a number of peers that respond to the data, which is kind of a single, single data point anyway? Um, well, maybe. Uh, do we mean that the data is stored in different locations? Like, for example, you know, your emails in Gmail are not stored in a single place because then if that container or that storage is compromised, then all your emails are kind of compromised. 
So Google is using kind of a distributed model where they stored, again, scrambled parts of the emails in different data centers, such that a violation of the physical security of a particular container doesn't really give an attacker anything because all the data which is there, it's still kind of uh, mangled. Like if they wanted to read uh, my emails, and uh, you know, access a particular container, they would still not get my emails because they are just parts of my emails. Uh, so they would need to conduct an attack on multiple containers to get kind of a ability to assemble the, the, the messages, right? Uh, so is that a distributed database? Um, so it depends. It depends what you want to distribute and what you want to decentralize and like how you kind of as, as assembling the data at the end, right? Um, so in, in the context of Bitcoin, it is quite um, quite straightforward because the database is actually replicated on every single node that is participating in the network, uh, but all of them kind of synchronize such that they have the same logical view of what the data is. Uh, so the data is replicated. Uh, but not strictly speaking distributed, right? So there is kind of a small nuance difference between something being replicated uh, in multiple locations and something being distributed in multiple locations, right? So like if I have a single database and I make two, two computers keep the whole single database in two places, I did a replication. I didn't do distribution, but the, the way Google does it, like they kind of uh, sp sp spread the data into multiple locations. That is more uh, semantically what distribution means, that you kind of are spreading it into two locations. And then to have the whole thing, you have to get it from two locations, right? So that's what we had with our, uh, yeah, I lost my beautiful circular hash table, right? So our hash table was distributed because no single node had the whole copy of it. But in Bitcoin, every single node has the whole copy of the whole data. Uh, so it's not strictly distributed, it's more like replicated. Uh, but some people say, yeah, Bitcoin is a distributed database and it's kind of not strictly speaking correct. Um, so just that. So what is a ledger? Uh, it's sort of like a, a kind of a log of, of entries, right? So you, you know, we use ledger for who owns what, whom, uh, so if Alice pays Bob, then, you know, in the ledger, there, there is an entry, Alice paid Bob 10 krona, and then Bob paid Marius 2 krona. And then we kind of have like all those entries. And then at the end of the month, we can do kind of a balance and we can see who has how many money, right? Um, well, what is barter? So that's question to you guys. Yeah, so Anushka has an uh, uh, answer when you exchange goods without using money. So it's sort of a service for service or goods for goods. Uh, so you don't use representational money to do, um, to do exchange, right? So let's say we go back in time and we, we, let's say we are in the time where we are exchanging uh, things for gold, right? I have some gold and I go to a market and I buy apples for gold. Uh, would that be a barter or would that be, uh, you know, um, normal money involving service exchange? So that's a bit tricky, right? If I go to a market and I say, look, I, I just have some fish. I, I am a fisherman. I, I brought fish and I want to buy those apples. And the guy says, yeah, give me one fish. I give you k one kg of apples. That would be clearly a barter, right? So I give them fish, I, I get the, uh, uh, the apples back. Uh, but if I go with a gold, then it is a little bit in between, right? Because gold itself is a, is a thing, it's a property and I'm exchanging gold for apples and then the other guy will exchange gold for something else, 
but then gold serves sort of like a like a um, like money um, you know uh, function. So there is this construct concept of representational money, right? Uh, representational money is like a money that doesn't really have value in itself. Like, you know, gold has value in itself, uh, but the representational money, like, you know, a Norwegian Krona banknote, that the piece of paper, it, it in itself, it doesn't mean anything or it doesn't have any value in itself. Like it's, it's worth really little for a small piece of printed paper, same with, with the coins. It's just a little bit of metal, uh, which costs very little, like it, it, it doesn't have value in its own. But if I have a gold coin, the gold coin weighs certain amount of gold and the gold itself has certain value, right? So it's, it's a difference. Um, yeah, so uh, sure I gave a definition, like the money could be an amount of uh, measure to put a value for a barter system in order to keep the basis for exchange on a definite definitive scale equivalent for all, right? So the idea is that you have this sort of a medium of exchange that money kind of does, which helps with the with the barter system, right? Um, and those concepts are evolving. Like we, uh, I don't think we stopped. Uh, we know everything. I, I, I know we reached a certain point of our understanding and we know what money means in the current settings, but we may not know what it will mean like once it evolves, like, you know, you can imagine that is like we are, you know, somewhere on the on the spectrum, right? So in the very early days, uh, we didn't have, we didn't use money. We, we just uh, use promises. Uh, so we use some sort of an accounting system for who gave something to somebody else. And then they kept track of uh, who sort of owns somebody something. So, you know, I, I need some apples. So the guy says, yeah, here you, you, you get your apples, but you know, remember like next time you have some fish, you will give me some fish, right? And I say, yep, I, I promise you like next time I, I get, get some fish, I, you, you're gonna get it, right? So we, we've been using like in small societies, we've been using this kind of a promise-based economy and it was working fine, it doesn't scale, right? It doesn't scale much. So then, you know, around 9,000 years before Christ, we came up with the concept of kind of a commodity uh, barter exchange, right? So we've used sugar or salt or tobacco or cotton or gold or some sort of uh, things like not really gold at that time, like gold came much, much later, but we've used some sort of a commodity in as representation of value such that we could exchange it for certain things, right? Um, and then, you know, we evolved certain abstractions uh, and for abstractions, we've used random things like we've used those uh, stones, um, you know, shells, rocks, and they, they uh, they've been used sort of as a, as a money. And you could say uh, some of them had certain value. They were kind of difficult to do, like for example, rye stones. Uh, and some of them had some sort of, a, they were rare. So that it was kind of difficult to, to get them. Uh, so we've, we've used those, but they were cumbersome to use as well. So we, uh, we moved to kind of a, another abstraction where we used like metals, including gold. And then like, uh, you know, relatively late, we started using gold as this sort of a uh, common equate or common thing which could work as money. Um, so um, in the early days, we had this kind of notion of uh, gift economies like in the, in the uh, very ancient times. Uh, and in, in, interestingly, um, in New Zealand, it was very common until very modern times. Like uh, New Zealand is a relatively young country, like, you know, 150, 160 years old. Uh, before that, it was uh, Polynesian um, islanders who were kind of colonized and, and, and used it. And they didn't use money. They used this kind of a koha um, concept in such a way that if you ask somebody for something, 
they will always give it to you. Like uh, if I need potatoes, I go to a potato farmer and they will give it, give me potatoes. If I need something and I ask for it, they will always give it whatever that is to me. But the catch was that I have to give them back equivalent value or more sometime in the future, right? So it was kind of an unwritten agreement that if I go and get something from somebody like as a gift, I have to give them a gift back on my own, like myself, uh, which is the same value or bigger to what I got from them, right? Because I was in need, I needed something. So uh, they gave me this and it solved my problem, but then I have to give them something that they may not need right now, but I need to give it to them as a gift and it has to be kind of a bigger than um, uh, that I already received. So it has this sort of a reward system built in such that if somebody comes in and you give it to them, you know that in the future you're gonna get the same or with, with extra percent, like with extra value back, right? Uh, and it worked quite well, but you know, it changed when um, uh, um, the islands get colonized and kind of modernized to, to the current form. All right, so let's, uh, let's have a, another break. I will open the, uh, the rye stones. Uh, so rye stones is a, the, the pecu peculiar currency, which is those uh, giant uh, rock stones uh, on a on a uh, particular um, uh, island on um, in Micronesia, uh, yeah, so some of the islands were doing it, and uh, the concept was that there was an island without any rocks, and to have those kind of uh, giant rocks, you have to travel on those tiny boats to another island, get those rocks out, ship them back, shape them in in a certain way, and then they became kind of a very um, kind of valuable because it was not very easy to generate that, right? So it was kind of a unique, uh, yeah, exactly. So even if the, even if one of those kind of got lost or, or like, first of all, it was really hard to move it, right? So even if some of those belong to somebody else, they could still sit in somebody else's property because it was just kind of really hard to move them around, but they knew this stone belongs to the other guy, right? Uh, and then even if they sunk, uh, they continue share, you know, sharing it and, and dividing it and saying yeah, half of that one on the bottom of this, uh, of this ditch is you know, yours and half is mine and whatever, right? So they've used it as a, as a mechanism for keeping track of uh, who owns what and who, um, yeah, how, how to reconcile the kind of the accounts. All right, so let's have a, a break for another couple of minutes. Um, so let's do another timer. So let's, um, yeah, 10 minutes break and then we come back. Uh, how you type here, 10. All right, so let me stop the recording. Okay, so we were at um, some of the functions that money serve, right? So it, we've established already that it's a kind of a form of a medium of exchange um, because it solves the gift economies or barter uh, based economies uh, inefficiencies. Um, <clears throat> and also, in both the gift and barter economies, like what's the use if I give whoever gave me uh, apples before some fish, if they already have like so much fish that they cannot eat right now uh, because they got a lot of gifts from other people and then like they cannot freeze it. Like the, you know, freezers have not been invented yet. So like the, um, the double coincidence of wants is a problem where you know you have to have both parties to need the other thing such that the exchange is as valuable to both of the sides right so medium of exchange is definitely the the um one of the biggest mo most important functions of the of money uh, a unit of account is you know this uh what uh Shure was talking about this kind of relative worth uh what um you know how do we deal with that right uh, so 
divisible, countable, and fungible. So there are, there are some people who think um, that money is like that this is not the main function of money. Uh, whoops. Uh, that the, the main function of money is really this, uh, not, not the medium of exchange, but really the concept of debt and how to deal with debt. Um, so um, it has been kind of coined by one of the authors in the, um, in the finance uh, sector uh, where they were researching kind of like how the central banks kind of came about and how the kings at the time wanted to finance kind of the wars and conquers of other countries uh, when they needed sort of to pay uh, the kind of uh, soldiers which were kind of hired uh, in order to, to do what they needed to do. So they, um, you know, normally uh, what happened was the, um, like if, if your country goes to a war, they kind of uh, get the resources of the other country and they kind of live off those resources, right? So there is a certain uh, harm that happens uh, but the resources are kind of there. But if the soldiers are kind of uh, defending your country, they cannot use up your own resources. So you have to have this kind of a concept of, of debt and a pay. Uh, and that kind of complicates uh, things a little bit. Um, so we have kind of a concept of divisible, which is simple. Like, you know, gold is great, but, you know, if, if I have, you know, a kind of a, a rock of gold, it's kind of really difficult to kind of devise it, right? So something that is divisible is better than something that is not divisible. Something that is easily countable, of course. Um, yeah, but gold, you know, you, you can take uh, those rice stones or you can take the, you know, uh, ox or, um, you know, chickens. So a single chicken is fine, but like half a chicken, well, that's already a problem. Countable, okay. And then what, what fungible is? So what, what does fungible mean? Any ideas? Yeah, th this is a um, simple concept. So, uh, but it has a little bit of uh, philosophical implications. So fungible means that something is exactly the same as something else. You can kind of swap them and there will be no difference, right? So if I have a banknote of um, 500 Norwegian krona, and Ben also has a banknote of 500 Norwegian krona, then it doesn't matter if we put both into like a basket and we take uh, one each back, if we got exactly the same or if we got the different ones, right? Uh, they are like, uh, banknotes are considered fungible because it's sort of, you know, doesn't matter. Same as a number on your account. Uh, you know, if you if you have a bank account and it says you have thousand krona, uh, this thousand krona is the same as any other thousand krona. It's it's kind of fungible. Um, having said that, the banknotes are not exactly fungible because they have a serial number, such that uh, some banknotes can be censored by the establishment, such that you know uh, after some bank robbery or whatever, the central bank may say, okay, banknotes from this series serial number to this one are kind of are considered, uh, you know, censored, like they are not uh, legal tender anymore. Uh, and you go to a shop and they kind of check it and say, no, you have a banknote from that range. Sorry, it doesn't work, right? So banknotes often are considered as a kind of a, a property that has a fungibility, but in like, if you look closely, it doesn't, right? So in terms of Bitcoin, are, are Bitcoin fungible? So is one Bitcoin uh, and another Bitcoin exactly the same? You cannot distinguish them or can you distinguish them? So the fact that something is indistinguishable doesn't matter how you use it. It's always indistinguishable. If you're using it in such a way that you don't look at the serial number, then it makes it look like it's fungible, but it may not be fungible kind of on the uh, core layer, right? You have an overlay network uh, and in the overlay network, it is fungible, but here it isn't, right? 
Exactly. So John Gunnar has a very good point. Bitcoin has a very strict history going all the on the way to the, you know, uh, the Coinbase, like the, the block which generated the particular Bitcoin. And then from that moment on, it has a history. So two Bitcoins are never the same. Like they always have a unique history uh, and that makes them not fungible. Um, so how about Ether? <clears throat> How many of you know how Ethereum works and how Ether accounts work? So um, Bitcoin uses this kind of a UTXO model and a UTXO model from the Coinbase, the, the coins have kind of a history and you can um, like, you know, the miner who, who got the original coin from the Coinbase transaction uh, let's say they, they got a 6.75 uh, Bitcoin, they have it and they spend it. Let's say they send it to Marius and then Marius sent three Bitcoin to, to Jon and now Jon has uh, three Bitcoin and then he can kind of uh, send it to somebody else or spend it or buy co coffee or whatever. And then the, the coin kind of tra uh, travels. And But while Jon has them, uh, they are kind of held in using this private public keep cryptography in a, in a transaction which has unspent outputs, which only Yon can unlock and pass them to somebody else. While they are sitting there, um, you know, nothing happens, right? In Ethereum, it's very similar, but Ethereum doesn't use the UTXO model. It uses an account-based model, okay? So for example, I can have a, a wallet with a single account and then uh, multiple people pay me Ether to that account. So let's say uh, five people paid me one Ether each to that single account. Now I have five Ether here. And if I take one Ether uh, and give it to Yon, uh, Yon will not know where this Ether is from. Like, is it from one of those five people or from other people who also paid to this account? Yeah, that, that information is sort of lost. So because of the account system, uh, Ethereum is a little bit more fungible than Bitcoin because the history is the history is there, but the history is every every single time the coin changes an account, it gets mixed with all the other coins which are in, already in that account. So if I paid Yon one Ether and he has an account of 500 Ether in that account, that one Ether went in and it's part of the wallet. It's part of this account. And then if he takes one coin out of it, you cannot tell to whom that coin belonged. You can only tell it was part of this wallet and you can track who else paid to this wallet, but you don't know exactly. With UTXO, you know exactly. You know exactly how the coin uh, life was and who paid whom through the entire uh, chain, right? So a Bitcoin has a, a less, Bitcoin is not fungible and Ether is to some extent more fungible than Bitcoin, but it's not, um, uh, th yeah, th th there are some limits to fungibility as well. And this fungibility in digital space, it's a bit of a tricky business because if you imagine a coin which is like um, perfectly fungible, then how would you keep track of whether the system is not, um, you know, doing something against the rules, like generating new coins out of thin air, right? Uh, you, you, you cannot have a perfectly fungible solution because then you would lose the ability to, to track what the system has been doing and where those coins came from such that you know um, the system hasn't been abused, right? Okay, so then we have the, the most controversial one, which is the store of value, right? So um, we don't know if that property is, um, positive or if it is a side effect of having money and it's a very negative property. Uh, nevertheless, there, you know, there is the expectation that um, we use money often as a store of value, such that if we have more resources that we need right now, we sort of uh, keep it for when we will need it such that we can get it, right? So let's say uh, I'm eating one apple a day uh, but I don't need to buy 365 apples today for the next year. I can buy, you know, five for a week and then I have some money. And then for that money, I know I can buy 
apples next week and next week and next week. So in fact, I already have like a reservoir for all my apples for the whole year, but it is represented as a sort of a store of value in, in form of money. And I hope that the money that I have in the store will let me buy, you know, five apples next week and five apples next week in such a way that I will have money enough to buy apples for the whole year. If the store of value is not reliable, if that um, money devaluates and if I go to a shop and say, I would like my five apples and they say, yeah, you need that much money and say, wait, wait a minute, I only have, you know, so much and I thought it will used to work. They say, yeah, well, you know, the money changed value, right? So when the value doesn't remain stable over time, that function is a bit broken, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter if it goes down or up, like any change of value is like messing up with the with this function. So the, the stability of that function is kind of desirable. Unfortunately, in the economy, like we don't have that guarantees and we don't have anything that is sort of stable over time. Like we would like, maybe, I, I don't know, I, as I'm saying, like I'm not saying if this property is positive or negative, maybe this stability is introducing problems in the world, right? So we have inequality problems with the some of the wealthiest people in the world becoming even more wealthy. Uh, and then wealthy families are kind of continue to be wealthy because of the store of value. Uh, and some governments, including Norwegian government, they consider kind of um, storing of value as, as somewhat negative such that you have the wealth tax, right? So they, they say, okay, you can store value, you can accumulate wealth, but if you're doing it above a certain threshold, uh, we, you have to pay certain, um, um, let's say small penalties uh, because you're doing that, right? So they see it like they don't encourage it, they discourage it by having those fees that you have to pay, right? Um, so uh, th this is a bit controversial. So some theories suggest that maybe um, this kind of a uh, storage of value is causing some problems uh, with the with the social systems that, that we have. Uh, and then with those two first ones, some people think the medium of exchange is very important and very fundamental. And some people say, no, that's a side effect of the concept of debt, that debt is the, the most fundamental thing in, in concept of money, right? But because we are technology students, not economists, well, I'm gonna skip a um, couple of things and we are gonna jump here. So in terms of centralized versus decentralized systems, we have um, kind of a long history of money, right? So the, as we've seen here, the history of money goes like, you know, into ancient times. And if you look at it, none of it was centralized, right? The concept of centralized money, like the central banks is so young that it's kind of almost irrelevant in the history of, of when we were talking about exchange, uh, value exchange and money, right? Uh, that's a very, very modern concept, which is very, very young and it's sort of unusual, right? So, you know, all modern currency systems, all central bank currency systems in all the countries are centralized. Uh, and then everything else was always decentralized. Uh, so then you may say, oh, well, then it's kind of interesting. Like we, for thousands of years, we lived with the decentralized economies, with decentralized economic systems. And now we have a period where we are living in a kind of a centralized, central bank kind of driven systems, which is just a glitch on the, on the long spectrum of history. So it may, it may make you kind of wonder Maybe that's kind of a bug. Maybe, you know, economic systems supposed to be decentralized like they were always. Uh, maybe that's something, un, you know, um, undesirable. Um, I don't know. Uh, what we know is that the next generation of money, the next generation of currencies are kind of here. Uh, they are decentralized. So we have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum, we have uh, other systems that are experimenting. Uh, with decentralized finance, and they're kind of on the on that side of the equation, right? So we maybe there will be something interesting kind of uh, happening here, such that it will uh, disrupt the status quo, the status quo of the kind of existing systems. 
I don't know, um, but I think it's extremely interesting uh, and kind of exciting times to, to live in. <laughs> All right, so Bitcoin. Um, it was released as a white paper in, um, at the end of 2008. Um, relatively simple concept, like we went through the fundamentals and like uh, an hour ago. Um, and <clears throat> it is decentralized same as give economies and all the other kind of currency systems. Um, but it like these previous systems, they didn't use representational money. They use kind of a barter or commodity money. Uh, and uh, we didn't, um, we sort of had those uh, stones and uh, muscles and so, some sort of uh, representational abstractions that we used in the past. Um, but not to the same extent. So the, the uh, Bitcoin is a representative money uh, and it is kind of a self, um, self-regulating self and peer-to-peer uh, -peer currency with some interesting properties. Uh, one interesting property which, distinguishing, which distinguishes Ethereum, for example, from Bitcoin is that Bitcoin doesn't have a foundation. Uh, there is no single legal entity which controls the, the experiment the experiment kind of controls itself. Um, there are developers who contribute time and effort to writing the proposals and um, you know Bitcoin improvement uh, protocol proposals. Um, and there are miners who are kind of uh, uh, solving the, uh, the riddle. Uh, and there are companies which are kind of investing in and doing stuff with it, but there is no central control mechanism which says, uh, it should be done like this. Um, there are certain um, initiatives like which uh, try to make it into more of a consortium driven project, uh, some forks, uh, but it, so far it didn't kind of work that well uh, for, the, for the other forks. And the core Bitcoin protocol is uh, relatively stable and relatively slow moving and self-organizing, right? So it kind of is self-regulating. Um, so it is uh, a form of electronic currency. Uh, it is, as we were discussing the term, it's not really a distributed. I would rather say it's a kind of a replicated, um, replicated database. Uh, it uses the peer-to-peer -peer overlay network uh, for sending the messages and coordinating. Um, there is no central authority, no clearing houses for payments. Uh, the payments are done in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, but not in a way that I need to contact Yon to make him a payment. I need to contact the network. And if I make the payment into a network, he is guaranteed to get the money. Like the, the money will be his. It's sort of like sending this message, which is uh, encrypted for, for Yon or for Bob. And then whoever owns the private key can always use this UTXO to, to spend it, right? Um, it is a hard currency. So they, they have been, uh, there was a slide which I skipped uh, about soft and hard currencies. So soft currencies have reversible payments. So for example, a clearing time might be, you know, 72 hours such that if you, if you notice that you have some uh, uh, weird transaction on your visa or whatever, you can say to your bank, look, 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 uh, there is this transaction uh, and it, you should cancel it, right? Um, it actually happened, uh, it happened to me, like I, I was double charged by a car company uh, in yeah, one, one of the countries, let's say, I will not say the name of the country. Uh, and then I contacted my bank and say, look, uh, I think they, they might have double charged me, right? And they sent me like, can you show us like the, the bill of what the value should be and what you were charged for? And I said, uh, like make a photo and they blocked this transaction such that I paid, but the next day they kind of blocked it such that the, the, the receiving end never got the money because the money disappeared from my account, but they never got it. And then the money kind of appeared back, right? Uh, so you have sort of reversible payments. Uh, so credit card payments or PayPal are example of soft currencies. And hard currencies, once you make the payment, it's the money is gone, right? So um, if I meet with, uh, with Ben and I give him 500 krona and he takes it, then like 
is it reversible or non-reversible? Well, you know, I can convince him to give it the money back to me uh, for whatever reason, but normally like, you know, the money is his, like he has it in his hand and the money is his, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, some currencies are reversible or, you know, hard. Um, so uh, Bitcoin is, uh, where was it? Yeah, so Bitcoin is a hard currency. So if you make a mistake and by mistake, I mean, if you just make one bit mistake in who, where are you sending it or what is the change and what is the payment or if you mess up anything, most likely the money is gone. Like, and the money is not gone in a sense of going to wrong hands, the money just disappears, right? So there have been a lot of cases where people, for example, make a payment to a wrong address. They make like a typo and then the money is gone because with the typo, there is nobody who knows what is the private key of that, you know, mistaken address. And then the money sits there in this UTXO, but nobody will ever uh, get the money because it's very hard to find a collision such that you can kind of claim it. Uh, by the way, there is a pastime, like there is an activity uh, where you can keep searching for um, collisions in all the addresses which are currently in the blockchain in such a way that if you're lucky, like, you know, lucky, lucky person, uh, you may get kind of, you can find like a collision and then you can claim the, the amount of that, of that particular address, right? Uh, it's very unlikely that you will, you will get it, but um, some people, you know, uh, consider luck something that can be, um, that has to do with the fate or the kind of, um, I don't know, like, you know, some people find it kind of um, fun to do, right? Uh, it is a form of stealing somebody's money, right? So if, if it happens that you find somebody else's uh, collision to, to the private key, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of rob them of their value, right? So that that is probably ethically something that uh, is not good to do, but th there are people doing that. Um, all right, so the total number of Bitcoins is like, uh, roughly speaking, 21 million. Um, and um, it's kind of divisible to eight places, eight decimal places, right? So we have uh, one Bitcoin, which is worth 100 million Satoshis. And then one Satoshi is the smallest unit that you can exchange. So it is kind of uh, integer based. We don't have um, floating points here. Uh, although it is represented as one dot and then eight decimal places afterwards, right? Uh, but in fact, you know, all exchanges and um, most financial institutions will use kind of an integer based arithmetic such that you don't have rounding errors propagating. And then you have transactions and that transaction is uh, something that, as I said, like I initiate as a payer uh, who owns a particular UTXO uh, so I issue a new transaction to the network and then whoever is going to get it doesn't need to do anything. All I need to know is the public key which identifies them. And then as long as they have a private key which, uh, which goes with this public key, they can always spend the, the, the UTXO, right? So here we have um, an example of... Uh, I think, yeah, I didn't put the transactions in. So let's say I have to copy the transaction as well. So if I go to this block, so usually if you go to a explorer, uh, you can explore um, the blocks and the block consists of many transactions which are kind of in the block. Uh, and then you can explore individual transactions, right? <clears throat> and blocks are usually identified by an uh, integer. Uh, and we kind of say, probably if I don't do hash, that it, it's going to find it because that doesn't look like anything else but a block number. And we count the blocks from one onwards, right? So this number continues to grow. Every time a new block is found, kind of a new, um, a new number is added. So as you can see, the latest block in uh, Bitcoin is 671,000, 
so that's the, the latest block um, that was found uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, and on average, the blocks are roughly mined every 10 minutes, right? So you see that the difference here is 16 minutes, the difference here is 10 minutes, then it's like um, uh, seven minutes. And then those two blocks were mined uh, like almost instantaneously. So there was almost no time delay between those two. And then there was, um, uh, what is it, uh, eight minutes. So on average, the, um, the time between the blocks is around 10, 10 minutes. So let's go to this block. I don't remember why I put that particular one. So let's see in Bitcoin. Um, all right, so this is a very simple block. Uh, it only has one transaction, right? It doesn't have any other transactions. It only has the reward Coinbase transaction, uh, which gets to the miner. Um, so when the miner uh, finds the block, uh, they usually include a number of transactions from the mempool such that um, those transactions sort of get uh, like sealed in the, in the block. But this, in this particular instance, like um, a miner found a block uh, which was with no, with no transactions added and they just did it for the reward, right? Um, and then you may consider, is it like um, a good thing to do or should that be uh, prohibited by the protocol? And in Bitcoin, it is not prohibited. Uh, the blocks which are kind of empty are, are allowed. Uh, and it may happen that you don't really have any transactions to include, but you can still, you, the clock is still ticking. So the, the blocks still continue to be generated every 10 minutes, even if nobody is sending anybody any money, right? Um, so then you have the, the hash of the block uh, and the hash of the block consists of a certain number of zeros, which are kind of in front and this sets the difficulty of the, of the block uh, such that you take um, the uh, information which is included in the block and then you have to find a hash uh, which will have a certain number of zeros up front uh, and that will pass the kind of the difficulty check and that's what makes it hard and that's what makes it this sort of the, the mining puzzle um, for uh, brute forcing uh, different uh, combinations of nouns uh, such that you have this uh, nouns and you have the additional kind of a field that you can ma manipulate in such a way that it generates a particular hash like nothing else can be manipulated like you know the certain things that are in the in the block are kind of static uh, but some things can be tweaked to generate a particular a hash and you're basically doing this brute force search uh, which is kind of completely random uh, and trying to find the block which uh, block hash which satisfies that particular uh, constraint all right so uh, what else do we do we have um, yeah so we talked a little bit about this process of discovering or sorting this this puzzle um, the mining difficulty is set roughly every every two weeks, uh, 2016 blocks. It checks how much time it took for uh, the generation of the certain number of blocks, right? So how long it took the 2016 blocks. Uh, if that number was much shorter than two weeks, the difficulty grows. If that a number is much longer than two weeks, the difficulty uh, reduces such that uh, it, on average, it, it is generated, as I said, like roughly, um, you know, six blocks per hour, ten, uh, 10 minutes per block. And uh, the reward originally was 50 Bitcoins. Uh, and then um, it, it halves up approximately every four years. So every 200,010 blocks, the reward halves, right? So it, it used to be um, 50 Bitcoins, uh, then it went down to 25 to 12.5. And then last year in May, it went to 675. So um, right now, if we go back to the Explorer and if we go back to the latest block, 
Uh, so if we if I check the latest block, which was 21 minutes ago, uh, you will see that um, the Coinbase um, coin the first transaction in every block is this reward for the miner. It's the newly generated coins, and you see. Well, it's 753, you said 675, right, Mariusz? And it's like, yes. So 675 is the reward, which gets to the miner, plus all the fees, which are from the transactions, right? So the transaction take kind of the unspent um, uh, output. They supply the particular public um, a private key signature for the public key, and then they can send the, the, the value out, right? So in this particular case, you have eight Bitcoins, like 8.16 Bitcoins being sent to those uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven addresses, uh, eight, uh, yeah, eight, address, uh, eight addresses, uh, and the total amount from 8.16.14 is 8158, right? So there is some Bitcoin missing, right? So this amount got spread all over those eight transactions, but the sum of all those transactions makes it smaller than the initial input. And the difference is the fees. So the difference is this, uh, and this difference gets to the to the miners, right? So the miners also get the, uh, the transaction fee, which is the difference between what was on the input and what is on the output, and then the difference kind of gets uh, to the miner as a, as a fee, such that the 675 plus all the fees, which are from all those transactions, there is a quite a large number of transactions in this block. Uh, we should see um, how many transactions you have, number of transactions, yes. So there is you know, over 3,000 transactions in this particular block. And all those fees from those transactions kind of get uh, combined with the mining reward and they add, add up to this value which the miner gets. Okay, so um, we have the reward. Uh, what else do we have? Um, and then we have the, um, the chain, like the block blockchain thingy. So, each block, like it all started with the Genesis block, so it was the very first block. And then we have the next block, which references the previous one. And then uh, the longest chain is used by all the peers. So all the peers um, agree that the longest one is the, the correct one, the, 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 the truth, the ground truth, right? The single kind of uh, ground truth. But the length is not just counted uh, by the by the blocks. So if I have, you know, now now I have like 671 uh, blocks. But if I have like five more, but the five more difficulty are um, kind of smaller than like um, one more with this extra difficulty, I will I will take the most difficult one first. So why why is that? Why I don't count just the blocks? Why do I need to measure it by the difficulty? Yeah, so the, the, the reason is uh, to prevent people doing kind of um, takeover attacks by generating a uh, large number of future blocks such that they can provide evidence that the difficulty at, at some point was lowered uh, and they kind of try to take over, right? Uh, to, to, so to prevent um, the, the forks to kind of uh, taking over by having uh, a certain level of difficulty um, being manipulated in order to kind of win the race of the longest chain. Um, to make it kind of uh, hard or impossible, right? Okay, so then um, we have, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, we have one more kind of heavy topic, uh, which is the script. Um, so the, the, the block header is a relatively static, you know, data structure that's relatively simple. 
the uh, concept here which we uh, need to understand is a Mer Mer Merkle root. So a Merkle tree is basically um, a tree of hashes, right? So if I have a lot of values and I kind of uh, take two of them and hash them into a parent, and then I hash those two into a parent and I keep hashing it, at the end of the tree, I'm gonna just get one hash, right? But this one hash can validate if all the children, all the leaves nodes hasn't been manipulated because if I start with, like, let's say I have those 3000 transactions, right? And if one of them got manipulated, this top level hash would be different, right? So I can validate if none of those uh, transactions at the bottom has been tweaked or manipulated by just comparing a single hash on the top of the tree, right? So a Mer Merkle root is this uh, kind of a, a transaction hash tree which I can use to validate if the entire tree is correct by just supplying a single hash, right? You may say, yeah, sure, but could you just hash all those transactions into a single hash? Uh, and the answer is yes, you would. But uh, if I did that uh, and I need to validate it, I would need to, um, like, I can validate it, but then I will not know uh, let, let's say I, I've done it and then it fails. So I, I have, let's say 3000 transactions, I have a single hash and then all those 3000 transactions don't hash to that hash. And I say, yeah, uh, one of them is broken, right? But you don't know which one, right? Uh, so if you have the tree uh, and you have this kind of a pairwise hashing, you can kind of start doing those, uh, those um, uh, traversal and then you can identify which one is the one which messes up in such a way that it doesn't lead to the to the hash that you need right so you can identify isolate a single one uh, that is broken out of the the leaves um, all right so then uh, we have um, a transaction which which we will skip uh, and then we have one more concept before we close for today so this concept is um, we need to have some sort of mechanism, so, some sort of a programming language, which allows us to um, check if the supplied uh, witness for a particular UTXO actually matches what is expected, right? And the way Bitcoin does it is um, they have kind of a, to validate Bitcoin transactions, they have a built-in uh, fourth like programming language, which is based on stack and it's very simple. Uh, it uses reverse Polish notation for the operands and the uh, um, arguments for the stack. And it allows to, uh, to make certain um, operations, certain calculations. Let me see if we can get uh, to this transaction, for example. Um, and if we can see the script. Um, so this is all fine. Yeah, so you see uh, for some of them, uh, we have this kind of a um, stack-based language, which uh, basically says, okay, all the op uh, operations are prefixed with OP, which stands for op operation. And then you have some operations like duplicate the top of the stack and then hash the top of the stack with the uh, ripe MD hash such that I get this sort of the, the hash of the uh, signature. And then I put this value onto the stack and then I check if this supplied value matches the one which I kind of got from the, from the hashing. And then if they match, then I can spend, right? So this is like a... Uh, uh, a script which will, which will validate uh, if whoever wants to uh, spend the money will kind of supply the necessary hash for being able to match the public key hash which was used to, to hash the transaction for the spending. Um, and each transaction kind of has that. So some of them, um, some of them are slightly different, like this one is a shorter one. It just calculates um, a single hash and then has the equality check. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have the signature verification. 
So this one, like, you know, th like this one is the same as this one. And it's a sim sim simple transaction where somebody owning a private key can get the money, can spend the money. This one is not about public key, but it's about finding the plain text, which hashes to, uh, to that particular um, value, right? So whatever you supply is gonna get hashed. And then if it matches this, if, the, if, if whatever you supply is a plain text with this hash, with, with the hashing operation matches this, this string, you can spend the money, right? So it is called a uh, uh, pay to script hash. And the script is some sort of a small program again, like this one, uh, which basically does what the transactions should do. Uh, and then you can kind of claim the, the coins out of it uh, if you know what that, what that script is. So that script could be like a single payment to one person. It could be a multi-party multi, multi -party payment. It could be kind of time lock of some sort. It could be whatever. And now by brute forcing the search, like if you could find a hash collision, you could basically claim that particular, you know, that particular amount of, of, of Bitcoins, right? Not probably not worth the, the, the hassle. Um, all right, so four o'clock, uh, we talked quite a lot uh, about various things. Um, and we went from quite high level uh, fundamentals to the uh, Bitcoin script. Uh, there are some resources at the end of the slides, which you can, uh, you can check if you're interested. Uh, yeah, mostly here and here. Um, and I have a couple of more slides which go over some of the transactions. Uh, so what I will do is I will post the slides and we can um, revisit this topic uh, a little bit later if you kind of get a little bit more um, into it. Like I really like the, the concept of the scripting and the, even though the scripts are not Turing complete, you, you have very limited amount of what you can do with it. It's still powerful enough that you can do quite complex systems like you know lightning network it can be built on top of bitcoin like this identity systems done by microsoft that can be built on top of bitcoin as well uh, so you can kind of build additional things additional services uh, as an overlay of the fundamental bitcoin network itself all right so that's all for today uh, thank you guys and i will see some of you on tuesday and some of you will see your supervisor tomorrow. Do you have any questions?